All right, welcome back everybody after the uh, break session for this first afternoon talk. Uh, we're very lucky to have Martin Taylor, uh, who recently just finished a, a brilliant mini course uh, that you can watch online. Today, he will be talking to us about the nonlinear stability of the Schwarzschild family of black holes. Martin. Okay, thank you. <laughs> that's fine, that's fine. We could just speak okay. into the, yeah. So I'd like to start by thanking Martin for the invitation. It's a pleasure to be able to speak here. So I'm going to talk about nonlinear stability of Schwarzschild family black holes. Everything I'll say is joint work with Aristotemos, the Staphosical, and Ipa Rodinsky. So I'll begin with some preliminaries. I'll uh, remind you of some of the basic properties of Schwarzschild family and then say a bit more precisely what I mean by their stability. Then there are linear difficulties in this problem and there are normal difficulties. So I'll begin by describing the linear difficulties which appear already in this problem of linear stability of Schwarzschild. And then uh, at the end, I'll move on to discuss some of the, the new normal difficulties. So Schwarzschild is the most famous family of solutions of the vacuum Einstein equations. It's a one parameter family which was discovered already by Jim But it was not understood until much later that each member of this family describes a, a static black hole. And the parameter M has the interpretation of the mass of that black hole as measured from the field. So the Schwarzschild exterior, the black hole exterior region, is complete, meaning that observers can live in the exterior for all proper time and remain causally disaffected by one of those things. Excuse me, can you speak a bit louder? It's very difficult to hear. Yeah, maybe, maybe, maybe. Okay, is that better? Okay. I hope I don't mean you. Because then there's going to be an echo because mine's connected to the wall laptop, which is recording through this. And mine's connected to your laptop. Try, okay. try talking. Okay. See. So the observers can live in the exterior for all proper time and remain unaffected by what occurs in the in interior. So more precisely, there's an asymptotic boundary due to no infinity, which can be attached to Schwarzschild. And the, uh, this due to no infinity is complete. And the black hole exterior is characterized as the causal past of that boundary. And of course, this is not the entire Schwarzschild manifold, but it's bounded to the future by, by a complete event horizon at R equals to M. So the most basic question we can ask about this family is, is the black hole exterior region non-linearly asymptotically stable as a solution of the vacuum Einstein equations? So a first version of the theorem, which again is joined with Fermos, Hosegel, and Rodniansky, is that the answer is yes. So in the exterior, Schwarzschild is non-linearly asymptotically stable as a solution of the vacuum Einstein equations. So of course, if you have any familiarity with this subject, you'll know that there's only one sense in which this theorem could possibly be true, and that's if it's true modulo curve. So Schwarzschild, of course, sits inside the larger family of stationary solutions, the, the curve family uniformly rotating black holes. So this is a two-parameter family. There's a mass M, again, now also a, an angular momentum parameter A. And if you set A equal to zero, Kerr, as is well known, reduces to Schwarzschild. So Kerr is two, is a two-parameter family. Schwarzschild is a, a one-parameter family. So it's tempting to think that Schwarzschild is co-dimension one inside Kerr. In fact, to parameterize smoothly, 
you should think the court. Uh, I mean, I'm I'm really not. Uh, I really don't want to say anything firm. But I mean, if uh, if I'm if I have to say something, this is what I would say at the moment. Yeah. Is and then one? we'll see. Yeah. So let me know what uh, what reaction you get and so on. So to parameterize smoothly, you should think Schwarzschild is not co-dimension one inside curve, but co-dimension three. The idea being that if uh, you are in Schwarzschild and you'd like to describe a nearby member of the curve family, not only do you have to prescribe a, a mass, but you also have to prescribe an axis around which the curve black hole is rotating. So the, the, the axis together with the angular momentum is three parameters in total. Therefore, you should think that Schwarzschild is co-dimension three inside Kerr. But in any case, Kerr with small a is a small perturbation of Schwarzschild, and it certainly does not converge back to Schwarzschild. So stability of Schwarzschild means uh, stability modulo Kerr or full finite co-dimension stability of Schwarzschild. So the main theorem can more precisely be stated as follows. For all data, which is close to a member of Schwarzschild with some mass M initial, and moreover, lying on a co-dimension three submanifold of the space of initial data. So you should think Kerr does not lie on this co-dimension three submanifold, but moreover, for any initial data which does not lie on this submanifold, the endpoint of the evolution will not be Schwarzschild, but it will be a member of the Kerr family with, with A not equal to zero. So it's in this sense that this is a full finite co-dimension. So for all such data, the resulting solution shares this qualitative property of Schwarzschild. So it possesses a, a complete fusional infinity whose causal path is bounded to the future by a, a complete event horizon. Or in other words, um, the perturbations exist globally as measured by observers from the future. Second, the solution remains close to, to the Schwarzschild, which was perturbed in the exterior. And third, the solution decays at an inverse polynomial rate to a, a nearby member. So the first of these three points you should think is the statement of weak cosmic censorship in a neighborhood of Schwarzschild. The second point is the orbital stability of the Schwarzschild family. And the third point is the asymptotic stability of the Schwarzschild family, all restricted to this co-dimension three submanifold. Okay, and of course, the, um, the first two should still be true if you remove that restriction it's uh, the restrictions necessary in, in view of the third point and remember that uh, in view of the supercritical nature of the nonlinearity in the Einstein equations we have to prove all three of these things at the same time so there have been many many relevant previous works I'll mention a few now and I'll mention some more later but unfortunately I don't have time to mention everything that's relevant so I apologize to anyone who I who is not mentioned. So the, the, the first nonlinear stability work in a, this asymptotic class setting is the, the celebrated proof of the stability of Minkowski space from the, from the early 90s of Christopher and Kleinman. Uh, stability of Schwarzschild has been studied in some symmetry classes. Uh, by far the simplest symmetry assumptions are those which reduce it to a one plus one dimensional problem. There have been some older works of Krista Dulu, Fermos Rodnianski, and also the PhD thesis of, uh, of Paul Ziegler. Beyond one plus one dimensional reductions, the, the problem becomes considerably more involved. The, um, the, the, the first work beyond the one plus one dimensional reduction is a, a very nice work of Klein and Jeff Bell from 2018 on stability of Schwarzschild in polarized axisymmetry. Uh, one can also study this problem with a with a positive cosmological constant and the stability of the slowly rotating Curtis Sitter family was shown in, in 2016 by by Vincent Fashion. So there's there's many more works, and I'll mention many more as we go. So then, of course, one would like to generalize 
uh, this to the to occur in the in the pulse of extreme old age, and one can begin with the, the very slowly rotating case in which aspects of the Schwarzschild theory can be perturbed. And this work in progress of several different groups on this problem, uh, in particular, there's uh, recent and forthcoming work of Georgie Kleinem and Schechtel, Kleinem and Schechtel and, and Shen. And I believe we'll hear more about this in the, in the talk of Sergi tomorrow. So back to Schwarzschild. So um, in these type of problems, the the relevant linear analysis which one invokes is not that of the solution which one perturbs, but it's that of the solution which one converges to. And since this theorem is everything which converges to Schwarzschild, uh, these, these solutions are everything which can be in, understood using only the linear theory around Schwarzschild as opposed to the linear theory around uh, with table. And the linear theory around Schwarzschild is, uh, is a lot cleaner in many senses. So in particular, the, the proof is, is based entirely in, in physical space. It's based on this linear stability work of Thomas Holzig or Rodnianski. Moreover, the, the proof is based on a, on a double null gauge. So double null gauge, there are some linear advantages and, and some nonlinear advantages of double null gauge. And I'll, uh, I'll get to those later in the talk. A disadvantage of double null gauge is that it is quite burdensome, especially if it's not something you're familiar with. However, nowadays there are many works on uh, on Einstein equations in, in double null gauge. It's something which is uh, familiar from, from many problems. And um, these problems, they, they, they describe a wide, a, wide, a wide range of different phenomena for the, for the Einstein equations. And if, um, if you do put the effort into, into learning double null gauge, it's not some niche thing. It's, uh, there's a huge payoff from, from doing so. So double null gauge means a coordinate system, U, V, D to one, T to two, such that the level hypersurfaces of U and V are outgoing and incoming null codes respectively. And they intersect in space like two spheres on which theta one, theta two are, are, are coordinates. So for example, I wrote down Schwarzschild in the in the most familiar TR coordinate, uh, in the most familiar TR coordinate system on the first slide. In practice, it's actually much more convenient to consider Schwarzschild in this canonical Eddington Finkelstein double null form. So here R now is a, is a function of U and V. However, and this is one of the, um, uh, this is one, uh, one of the big complications of this problem. This is far from the unique way to write Schwarzschild down in, in, in double null gauge. And in fact, there's this infinite dimensional family of residual double null freedom. So there's a whole infinite dimensional family of, uh, of double null gauges for, for Schwarzschild itself. And in a moment, I'll show you how one can uh, parameterize that residual double null freedom. So there's a few more difficulties one can immediately preempt. So first, the black hole exterior is only characterized teleologically. So this means that um, it's impossible to say a priori at the level of initial data exactly what's going to lie in the black hole exterior and what's going to be in the, in the interior. Recall the black hole exterior is characterized as the, the past of future null infinity, and a priori one does not have a future null infinity. So the only way to characterize the exterior is to solve the problem globally and, and, and see what's in the, in the past and future null. However, I'm only making any claims about this problem in the exterior. I'm not claiming anything beyond the, the exterior. So this means not only is the, the solution an unknown in this problem, but the domain on which the solution lives is, is also an unknown. Second, the, the double null gauge in which the solution finally decays to Schwarzschild, this is also teleologically normalized. And this is also something which has to be determined as a part of the proof. 
So the gauge will be normalized both to the event horizon and the future null infinity. This is convenient for the analysis, and I'll, I'll explain why a little bit later. But you should think as a, as a bonus of this normalization, normalization to future null infinity, there's an immediate connect with the, the physics literature. So in particular, the gauge is bonding. And as a bonus of this normalization, one can immediately, a, a posteriori, understand um, familiar laws of gravitational radiation from the physics literature, and also nonlinear effects such as the, the Christodulian memory effect. Finally, and this is a, uh, a, a, a nonlinear issue, this codimension three submanifold is also only characterized teleologically. So the, the initial data, which lies on this co-dimension three submanifold, the corresponding solutions initially contain exactly the amount of angular momentum which they radiate in evolution. And a priori, there's no way to know how much, a how much angular momentum a solution is going to radiate for the problem globally and, and, and see. So that means in this problem, it's not only the solution which is an unknown, but the region on which the solution lives is an unknown. The gauge in which the solution finally exists globally is an unknown. And moreover, even the initial data for the, for the problem is also an unknown, which has to be characterized as part of the proof. So this latter point is true in, uh, in general. However, there are infinite co-dimension subfamilies of this co-dimension three submanifold which can be explicitly identified. For example, the, the vacuum Einstein equations have this property that they do not radiate angular momentum in, in axis symmetry. So an immediate corollary of this, uh, this theorem is any axis symmetric initial data set, which moreover has vanishing angular momentum and is close to Schwarzschild, is automatically contained on this co-dimension three submanifold. So um, this, um, uh, this is an infinite co-dimension subfamily which can be explicitly characterized. Okay, so now I'd like to say how this uh, a convenient way to parameterize this residual double null freedom. So suppose one wants to define a, a, a double null gauge. Well, the first thing one can do is choose a, an arbitrary space like two sphere. So one has uh, already, in choosing a, a space like two sphere, one already has an infinite dimensional degree of freedom in doing this. Then one, once one has chosen a sphere, one can look at the, the causal future of that sphere. And the causal future is, the, sorry, the boundary of the causal future uh, consists of an incoming null cone and an outgoing null cone. The next thing that one gets to choose is a uh, foliation of each of these two uh, null cones by speeders, or if you like, one gets to choose speeds at which these two uh, null cones are foliated, the, the outgoing cone by the, the red spheres and the, and the incoming cone by the, the green spheres. Then one can do the same thing for, let's say, the red spheres. So one can look at the boundary of the causal future and the outgoing part of the um, the outgoing part of the boundary of the causal future of this red sphere coincides with the, the, the outgoing black cone that we began with. And the incoming part uh, consists of this dotted red line, this incoming null cone. And similarly for the, for the green spheres, they define these green cones. And the red and green cones intersect in this um, uh, space like blue spheres, defining a, a, a space time double population. So one can then choose U and V to, um, to be such that the, the level hypersurfaces of V are these incoming red cones, and the level hypersurfaces of U are these outgoing. Moreover, one sees now that um, if one were to choose this black initial sphere as nice as one possibly could, so for example, in Schwarzschild, choosing the black sphere to be as nice as it could would mean choosing it to be one of the spheres of symmetry of Schwarzschild. Then in Schwarzschild itself, 
if one follows this procedure and if one cho chooses those speeds at which those initial phones foliate nicely, then the blue sphere to the future will, will also be nice. So that will also be a, a sphere of, uh, that will also be one of the spheres of symmetry. But this fact is very, very special to Schwarzschild. So as soon as one considers a, a space-time which is, is, is not Schwarzschild exactly, but me, is merely decaying to Schwarzschild, as in the, um, as in the, the solutions of the theorem, the presence of curvature in these space-times will distort this process. And if the black sphere is as nice as possible, that will mean that the blue sphere will not be as nice as what it could be. And in particular, as you follow this for, the, 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 for all time, the blue spheres will not start to coincide with the uh, spheres of symmetry of Schwarzschild. So if one wants the blue spheres to start to coincide with the spheres of symmetry of Schwarzschild, the correct thing to do is not to choose the, the black sphere to be as nice as possible. The correct thing is to choose the blue sphere to the, to the future to be as nice as possible. Or to say that slightly differently, one would choose this initial black sphere not to be as nice as possible, but one would choose it in an informed way so as to interact precisely with the radiation present to uh, cause the, the blue sphere to the future to be nice. And a priori, we don't know how, uh, how uh, the solution is going to behave in, in evolution. And so this is the, uh, the need for the, uh, the teleological normalization of the gauge. And in particular, this is already a, a linear phenomenon. So one sees this fact already in, uh, one sees this distortion of these blue spheres already in, in, in linear theory. Well, provided that uh, you know what you are doing, I mean, it's not, it's not entirely clear that from linear theory. In linear theory, you have lots of possibilities. Uh, but anyway, are you going to tell us exactly how you make these conditions, that, uh, these theological conditions? Sorry, I mean, so in linear theory, if you choose the black sphere to be as nice as possible. But in linear theory, you have many, many possibilities. You can make many choices. Uh, the, the one which you, you are using here probably is, is, is very important and it makes everything work, I imagine, right? So, uh, so it, uh, but anyway, I mean, the question is, what are these theological conditions uh, at infinity that you are imposing? But so if, For the blue sphere, for the blue sphere. But if the black sphere is chosen to be as nice as possible, then in linear theory, the blue sphere will look bad in general. Certainly true, of course. Okay. So, so I'll, talk what are conditions? I'll, I'll talk more about the gauge uh, later on. Okay. Okay, so that's a double null foliation. Associated to uh, a double null foliation is uh, one can associate a canonical double null frame. And um, the analytic content of the Einstein equations is captured in the um, equations satisfied by the, the curvature components of this double null frame and the, the Ricci coefficient of this double null frame. So there's some standard notation for curvature components of, and Ricci coefficients, which I'll use, but um, you do not have to remember this notation for the talk. And the, um, the curvature components satisfy a, a system of Bianchi equations, and they couple to the uh, structure equations of, uh, of this gate, of this frame, satisfied by the, the Ricci coefficients. So this system of Bianchi and structure equations is the uh, uh, form the reduced Einstein equations take and uh, uh, the analytic content of the Einstein equations is captured in, 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 in those equations. Okay, so now I want to talk about the linear stability of Schwarzschild. So in the abstract, it's, it's uh, slightly non-trivial in view of the, the gauge issues to um, formulate the problem of linear stability of Schwarzschild. So let me immediately specialized to, to Schwarzschild linear stability in, in, in double null gauge. So linear stability of Schwarzschild means consider Einstein equations in double null gauge or this reduced system of Bianchi and structure equations. Linearize those equations around Schwarzschild and then show that um, solutions to this linearized system decay in time. To show that solutions are bounded and, and decay in time. 
So this is immediately complicated by the fact that this linearized system admits special families of solutions which, which do not decay in time. And one can immediately infer the, uh, the existence of such, uh, of such families. So the first special family of non-decaying solutions is uh, the family of what I'll call residual pure gauge solutions. So this is an infinite dimensional family and uh, this arises exactly from the, uh, this infinite dimensional degree of residual double null freedom at the, uh, the non-linear level. So this infinite dimensional family of diffeomorphisms, which preserve the double null metric at the, the double null form of the metric at the non-linear level. The, the second family of solutions is uh, a linearized Kerr family. So this is a, a four-dimensional family. And it can be divided into a, a one-dimensional family of linearized Schwarzschild solutions, which arises from the presence of nearby members of Schwarzschild at the nonlinear level. And the second is a, a three-dimensional family of fixed mass linearized curve solutions. And again, you should think that to describe uh, a fixed mass member of the curve family, one not only needs to describe a, an angular momentum, but also an axis around which it's rotated. And angular momentum together with the axis of rotation is, uh, is three parameters. It's the same, uh, the same degree. So there have been many, many uh, relevant works on this, dating all the way back to 1957, this work of Richie Greenberg. And uh, we've heard about many more references in uh, Peter's talk this morning. So um, I'll talk a bit about the proof of linear stability of Schwarzschild. That firm has also got the answer in 2016. Uh, there have been many extensions and generalizations, for example, in the work of Anderson, Bachtal, Blue, and Mark, which we heard about this morning. And uh, this has also been generalized to show linear stability of Rice and Nordstrom by Georgie. And I believe we'll also hear about this later in the, in the meeting. And the uh, uh, Tchaikovsky equation, the wave equation, which arises. The, stood, the boundedness and decay of properties, the boundedness and decay of solutions to the Tchaikovsky equation has been generalized. First to the very slowly rotating case by the Fermat's Hosegel on the and R, and then to the full sub extreme infer range by Schlafentop Rothman and the Sherrod da Costa. So recall the, the system of unknowns for Einstein equations in, in the double null gauge was this. Um, was the curvature components of Rishi coefficients and their linearized counterparts. I, did, I, um, I uh, used this one to, uh, to, to denote. So the, the linearized system, which these curvature components of Rishi coefficients satisfy, takes the following form. So it, it looks quite long to begin with, but uh, it's actually, uh, it's actually so the problem of linear stability of Schwarzschild then is to show that solutions of this system are bounded and, and decay in time, modulo these two special families of, of non-decaying solutions. So uh, this is exactly what uh, Dr. Hosegel Rodniansky showed in, in 2016. But more precisely, they showed that for any initial normalized data, the resulting solution is, is bounded in the exterior and decays to a member of the linearized curve family. After one renormalizes this residual double null freedom, so after one adds a, a residual pure gauge solution. Moreover, the, the residual pure gauge solution, which one adds, uh, this is itself bounded by, by, by initial data. And uh, the the analog of this property in the nonlinear theory is uh, is important for the for the nonlinear problem, and I'll uh, I'll comment on that a bit. Later. So, as in the nonlinear theory, as in the nonlinear problem, the the gauge of the of this linear theorem, or in its linear language, the residual pure gauge solution, which one adds, this is already um, defined teleologically, meaning it it depends on how the solution behaves in evolution uh sorry I, I i have a comment about this 
Uh, I don't quite understand what you are saying. So in, you, you said that uh, this theological gauge condition is defined at infinity, towards null infinity. But if I remember correctly, in, in this uh, linear work of the Fernos Holzig and Rodniansky, the conditions were uh, actually tied to the initial data in the sense that they were propagating on the horizon. So, this, yeah, so it's not exactly, it doesn't seem to be exactly the same. And I have another issue. This, this uh, is the same as the comment from earlier, but so this is just the statement that that blue sphere to the future will not be nice in linear theory if you choose the black sphere to be as nice as possible. Yeah, but you have to make choices on, on that sphere at infinity, which I presume you make. When you have this theological condition, it means you make certain choices. When you construct this sphere at infinity, you construct it based on certain choices. Now, the choices made in uh, the Fermos, Hotzig, and Rodniansky, if I remember correctly, were done on, or made on the horizon and were based on, on a propagation starting from the initial data. And you said that uh, this uh, theological gauge, gauge condition has nothing to do with the initial condition. So I, I'm a little confused about this. So I'm, I'm just saying that... Uh... And by the way, there is, there is another thing. When you talk about, when you talk about linear stable, you talk about decay. The, the decay rates in, in, uh, based on these conditions, which were imposed on the horizon, were not exactly optimal. For example, if I remember correctly, omega bar was only decaying like e to the minus a half. Isn't it correct? So it didn't have the full decay that you need in order to get the nonlinear problem. So, and I think it had something to do with the fact that the choice was not the choice that you are talking about. It was a different choice. So no, I'm just saying that the, uh, it's exactly the same comment. Not the same choice, I'm sorry, but it's not the same choice. Anyway, I don't want to interrupt you. We can talk about it at the end. But I don't think it's the same choice. I don't know what you mean, same choice, though, because all I'm saying is that uh, if you choose that black sphere in the picture to be as nice as possible. I don't know what it means. In linear theory, in, in, in the work of the Hermos Holtzian and Rodiansky, these conditions were imposed on the horizon. It was something fixed, and it was the condition was propagated from from the initial data, in fact, the intersections of the initial data of the horizon. So I, I'm not sure. I mean, I don't see uh, it's different. So uh, but don't, uh, I'm, I'm just saying that in this linear work, they renormalize the gauge freedom in a way which depends on how the solution has behaved in evolution. Yeah, that's true. But there are many ways of. That's, that's all I'm saying. It's not the one. Yeah, but that's not the one that you were talking about before. It's a it's a different one. In fact, actually, uh, yeah. Anyway, but we can talk at the end. I don't want to interrupt you. Okay, so in contrast to the nonlinear theory, however, the linearized analog of the location of the event horizon, this is already, uh, this is something which can be explicitly characterized in terms of initial data. And uh, moreover, the member of the linearized curve family, which the solution decays to, this is also something which can be explicitly characterized in terms of initial data. So in the, in the language of the, the nonlinear theorem, this would be the the linear analog of this co-dimension three submanifold. So that's something which can be explicitly characterized in terms of initial data. So the, the starting point of the analysis in the, in, in the proof of the linear stability theorem are two of the curvature components, alpha linearized alpha and linearized alpha bar. So these two curvature components are a gauge invariant which means they, um, they vanish for every pure gauge solution, or they, they, they do not depend on how this residual gauge freedom is formalized. And um, that means that these quantities can be studied independently of how this residual freedom is normalized. So these two quantities are, are gauge invariant, and moreover, um, as was first noticed by Barty and Press in the case of, uh, of Schwarzschild and, and Tchaikovsky, in the, in the case of Kerr, they satisfy uh, the wave equation which decouples from the rest of the system. We call the wave equation the Tchaikovsky equation. So it, it looks like the, the wave equation on Schwarzschild plus some potential, V1, which you should think the potential is good, plus this first order term. And you should think that this first order term looks bad. So it's difficult to control solutions to this equation directly. 
exactly in view of this uh, part of first order term. So in particular, there is no known conserved energy for the solutions of this equation. So the observation used by uh, Thermos Hosek or Radnyansky is, uh, is due to Chandra Sekar. And uh, so it's a it's an observation, a fixed frequency version of the Chandra Sekar. So the observation is if you take this one alpha and then take two derivatives, take something which schematically looks like taking two derivatives in this in this incoming null direction. Then uh, this quantity, this transform quantity T, satisfies the, the Reggie Wheeler equation, which first appears in uh, in that work of Reggie Wheeler in 1957 in a slightly different context. And similarly, the same equation is satisfied by uh, this quantity T bar, which is schematically arrived at by taking two derivatives of alpha bar in that outgoing one direction. So Reggie Wheeler equation looks similar to uh, Tchaikovsky equation. It's a wave equation. With Potential. However, now this bad first order term has, has vanished. So you should think that this is a, a good way of equation. So the Reggie Wheeler equation can be studied using the insights which have been developed over the years to study the, the wave equation on a fixed Schwarzschild or, or, or curve background. So the study of this problem, boundedness and decay of solutions of this equation, was initiated by Wald. 1979 for the case of Schwarzschild, and since then there have been many, many works. Unfortunately, I don't have the time to list them all. Uh, culminating in this work of Thermos, Rodnianski, and Schlapenta Brockman from uh, 2014. So we now understand boundedness and decay properties of solutions to this equation in the full sub extremal curve approach. So, study of this problem involves a, a quantitative understanding of three of the, the geometric properties of Schwarzschild. So the first is the, the redshift effect, which um, you should think is a good property of Schwarzschild. It has a, uh, a damping effect on waves. Second is uh, trap null geodesics. So these are null geodesics which do not cross the event horizon nor, nor escape to infinity, but orbit the black hole for all time. And the presence of such null geodesics is a uh, is a potential, a potential obstruction to uh, decay of waves. And the third property is the phenomena of super radiance, but this is only relevant in the, the case of Kerr. This is not relevant to Schwarzschild. So the insights used to develop, the insights developed to study uh, solutions of this equation can immediately be adapted to uh, study solutions of Reggie Wheeler equation. This leads to polynomial decay for solutions of Reggie Wheeler. And then uh, for these P and P bar. And then by inverting these transformations, uh, this leads to the polynomial decay for alpha and alpha bar. So that, that's the that gauge invariant part of the solution. Then um, the remainder of the solution uh, is uh, controlled using a, a system of transport analytic equations. So the remainder of that huge system, which I wrote down earlier, if you, um, uh, if you view alpha and alpha bar as known quantities, then that system takes the form of a system of transport and elliptic equations for the remaining quantities. And there's a hierarchical structure present in that system. So um, uh, one estimates these uh, remaining quantities in this hierarchical manner. Uh, using the transport and elliptic equations. The boundedness part of the theorem follows from integrating the transport equations forward from initial data. And uh, the decay part of the theorem follows from uh, renormalizing this uh, residual gauge freedom, or in this linear language, adding a pure gauge solution to conclude that certain quantities vanish for the future, and then integrating this. Uh, uh, these equations in this hierarchical manner backwards in order to, to include, in order to deduce decay. So this is the Elbrick, Elbrick and Richter, this controls the Elbrick and Richter 2 spherical harmonics of the solution. The L equals 0, 1 spherical harmonics is exactly where the, the linearized Kerr family lives. And uh, they, the, the L equals 0, 1 part of the solution 
decoupled completely in many theory from the, from the higher modes. And uh, after subtracting a, an appropriate member of the linearized Kerr family, which can be explicitly characterized in terms of initial data, then uh, one has a, a, a homogeneous system with vanishing initial data, hence the solution vanishes, uh, vanishes globally. So the L, L equals zero one modes were. So uh, the, the broad strategy of the nonlinear group is, uh, is based broadly on the same interesting strategy. But there are new difficulties. In particular, there's this issue of identifying this co-dimension free submanifold, which we call was explicit in linear theory. There's this issue of characterizing the, the black hole exterior, which again was explicit. There's the gauge which has to be further normalized. And in fact, in the, this nonlinear problem, there are two distinct double norm gauges which are, which are employed. And uh, the, the issue of controlling nonlinear error terms. So, nonlinear error terms are uh, particularly involved close to future non infinity. So, we know from the stability of Minkowski space that it's important to exploit the very special null condition present in the nonlinear. Nonlinearity of the Einstein equations, further. and uh, the, uh, there's also uh, around R equals three M, which is exactly where these trap null GD six lie forever. So the proof is uh, by a continuity argument, which is uh, standard. However, there are some slightly non-standard features of the continuity argument in order to uh, in order to treat these. So this is a continuity argument, but it's a continuity argument with a twist. So at uh, um, bootstrap time uf, so this is some final uh, retarded time, one not only has a solution and, and, and bootstrap assumptions for that uh, solution, one in fact has an entire three parameter family of solutions. One has a, uh, a bootstrap region. One has a double null gauge or two double null gauges normalized to that bootstrap region and appropriate bootstrap assumptions for each of these solutions. Uh, wait, don't you have to have also these three conditions uh, on the last sphere? The blues, the, the blue spheres that you have in your picture. Don't you have to have conditions on those? When you do the continuity of the argument, don't you have to impose such conditions? Right, so the gauge is normalized to the bootstrap region. And how, how do you normalize it? Uh, I can say comment more if you like in a moment. Okay. So um, the bootstrap assumptions take the form uh, uh, the solution minus Schwarzschild is, is small, and the member of Schwarzschild, which is, uh, is subtracted, is uh, identified by the L equals zero mode of one of the, the curvature components, rho at this final time. Then the, um, the bootstrap assumptions ultimately will only be improved for, not for every member of this three parameter family, but only for, uh, for a subfamily. And in the limit as this uh, bootstrap time goes to infinity, this um, range of parameters will shrink until it lands on just one solution, which, which finally converges to short. And uh, the region So to identify the, the submanifold, one considers uh, this entire three parameter family of initial data. So what can be freely prescribed as data in the, in the characteristic initial value problem embeds naturally into a, into a vector space. So one can add initial data sets together and, and multiply them by, by scalars. So then there are three reference, what I'll call linearized curve initial data sets which uh, account for the presence of this fixed mass linearized curve family in the, in the linear theory. So one begins with some initial data set, which is close to Schwarzschild, adds some small parameters of these three reference curve initial data sets and allows those parameters to vary to get to the uh, three uh, intentional parameters. So then at each bootstrap time, as I say, members of this family are thrown away if they've not radiated enough angular momentum 
uh, in quotation marks. And this is identified by the L equals one mode of one of the uh, curvature components. And in the limit, as this bootstrap time goes to infinity, everything is thrown away except a single member of that original family, which, which finally uh, converges to Schrodinger. So this is how the uh, three dimension, this is how the co-dimension three submanifold is characterized. So then the, the bootstrap region is defined to be the, the past of a late outgoing cone and a late incoming cone as depicted. And in fact, the, the bootstrap region is covered by not one double dot gauge, but by two distinct double dot gauges. So one corresponding to a, a near region and the other corresponding to a, a far region. So the, the near region is covered by a gauge um, normalized to the uh, uh, event horizon. In, and the near region close to the event horizon is exactly where the, the redshift effect is relevant. So the redshift effect appears in the context of the linear wave equation on the big Schwarzschild background. And there it had the desirable property. So there it was uh, provided a, uh, a, a dispersive mechanism for, for waves. However, from the, the back, backwards viewpoint, this redshift effect has the opposite effect. So the redshift uh, from the backwards point of view becomes a blue shift. And if the gauge is only normalized far from the event horizon, this redshift, which becomes a blue shift from the backwards viewpoint, causes um, the gauge to, to, to blow up exponentially. So the, the, the near gauge is normalized. There's a gauge normalized in this near region uh, to avoid that blue shift. The far region is where the null condition is relevant. So the null condition is the special structure in the nonlinearity of the Einstein equations, which is familiar from the stability of reflection states. And uh, in the limit, as this bootstrap time goes to infinity, this, this region becomes the, the black hole area. So the near gauge lives only up to something that looks like an R equals constant type of surface. And the, the far gauge lives uh, similarly down to a, a, what looks like an R equals constant type of surface. And the two gauges have some, some overlap region. So it's important to control the diffeomorphisms which, uh, which relate these gauges. So there are, there are three gauges in total now. There's the, the far gauge, the near gauge, and also there's the gauge in which the initial data uh, so, sorry, what is the last gauge? Excuse me, I didn't hear. So there's the, the near gauge, there's the far gauge, and there's the gauge in which the initial data is defined, on which one has the small yeah. association. Yeah, yeah. So it's important to uh, control each of these, uh, the diffeomorphisms which relate each of these pairs of gauges. And the, the, the relation between those two future normalized gauges and the initial gauge, this corresponds to the, the boundedness of the pure gauge solution in that linearized context. So the diffeomorphisms are controlled by uh, a satisfying elliptic system. So if one has a, a, a pair of double null gauges, the diffeomorphisms uh, which relate them are uh, satisfied with what can be viewed as an elliptic system which involves the, the difference between the Richard coefficients of those two gauges, plus some nonlinear non terms. And once one knows the, 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 the Rishi coefficients of the two gauges from this uh, elliptic system, one controls those diffeomorphisms. So then the analysis proper begins with the, the nonlinear analogs of these um, uh, quantities which in linear theory are gauge invariant. Uh, so now in the nonlinear theory, they're only almost gauge invariant, meaning that if one makes a change of gauge of size epsilon, they, um, these quantities alpha and alpha bar are only changed to order epsilon squared. And they now satisfy uh, nonlinear wave equations, which uh, again have a potential, which you should think looks good, and a, uh, a bad first order term, and now also with uh, nonlinear terms on the right hand side. 
And again, one can transform these quantity, this quantity alpha, which solves this nonlinear Tchaikovsky equation, into a P, which solves a, a, a Reggie Wheeler equation, which again looks similar, but now we have this part of those quantities. And again, so um, the, the normalization to infinity is convenient in order to exploit the no condition present in the in the nonlinearity space. So then the fact that these quantities are almost gauge invariant means that they only change under a change of gauge toward epsilon squared. And those epsilon squared quantities uh, involve the, the diffeomorphisms from the previous slide. So this means that one can control the initial norms of P and P bar in these uh, in these future gauges. And similarly, one can control the, uh, the relations between P and P bar at the interface between this near gauge and the, and the far gauge. So one, you should think, doesn't really have one solution of this equation P. One has two solutions corresponding to each of those two gauges. And one estimates uh, each of those on a, on a region bounded by a, a time-like boundary. And the, uh, the two boundary terms that one gets from those estimates cancel to, to linear order in view of this almost gauge invariance. So then the, the remaining quantities, again, satisfy a, a, a hierarchical system of transport and elliptic equations. But now the, uh, the, the system is only hierarchical to, to linear order. There are, there are nonlinear terms in which, again, one, one exploits null condition. And uh, the L equals two spherical harmonics are sourced by alpha, alpha bar, P, and P bar. And uh, the gauge conditions are exploited to include vanishing of some of these quantities to, to the future. And one uh, estimates these uh, hierarchically backwards to control uh, each of the two the quantities in each of the two gauges. So then the final part is the uh, L equals zero one modes of the um, solution. And in linear theory, the L equals zero one modes were, were, were a bit easier. In this nonlinear theory, this is exactly where this uh, uh, restriction of the subfamily comes in. So remember, L equals zero one was exactly where the uh, linearized curve family lived. And so the L equals zero one mode that was thought by uh, restricting this subfamily exploits the and integrating these equations hierarchically backwards from the future. So, okay, I'll finish that. Thank you. Yes, thank you, Martin, for your talk. So, please, Sergio. Yeah, so uh, first of all, let me say this was a very nice talk. I really enjoyed it. Uh, it's the first time that I actually have a, a complete picture of it, but I'm still very much puzzled about. You, you never told us what are the conditions at, uh, at infinity, in other words, of these blue spheres. You have to make some conditions. What are these conditions? Uh, I mean, I think that they're extremely important and maybe you should say something about them. Well, so I thought it would be a bit much, for, I mean, there's lots, so I thought it'd be a bit much for people to digest, but uh, the... No, I mean, those are very important. I mean, you should be able to say what are they, so exactly. So, those so, conditions. so there's there's two gauges. There's the uh, gauge in this near region, which is normalized on this final outgoing hypersurface and uh, this initial incoming hypersurface, along with. Uh, no, but I, I mean on the sphere, on the on the sphere at infinity, so you have all conditions, and in in uh, they, they have to uh, be specific. I mean, you, there are certain geometric quantities which are specified. What are those quantities? So the, the bar gauge is normalized on this um, initial, this final incoming hypersurface and this initial outgoing hypersurface. But it's, Condition. it starts at the, the black, I mean, the black dot, the sphere at infinity. I'm talking about that one, yeah. Yeah, the one so there. conditions there are of the form trace chi minus its Schwarzschild value is zero and trace chi bar minus its Schwarzschild value is zero. There should be three conditions, right? There should, uh, be one. there should be also maybe the mass aspect function, maybe. So there's a mass aspect function which vanishes on this incoming hypersurface, and there's a modified mass aspect function which so vanishes how, on that. How do these conditions compare with our GCM conditions in uh, 
So there's inevitably on, swap be... sheet, on the paper on swap sheet and later on the, the papers on care. So there's inevitably going to be relations between the conditions. The um, the the gauge is the also, same conditions or are they different? The gauge is also related to the um, gauge of the linear stability theorem as well. No, as I said, they are very different. Those kind those conditions are not imposed at infinity. They are imposed on the horizon, and in fact, they 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 very much depend on the initial conditions. I mean, they are propagated on the horizon from the initial condition. So uh, I mean, they have nothing to do with each other. So that's what I don't understand. I mean, uh, sure. I mean, <laughs> in linear theory, you can also find those conditions. By the way, there, there is a work of uh, Elena Georgi uh, in linear theory where, where she imposes exactly those conditions at infinity based, I mean, at, at the black sphere that uh, you, you, you have in your picture. But that's not in, in the paper of the Hermann Holtz and Aronyansky. I'm sorry about it. I just don't. Don't understand. Okay, but if you linearize this gauge, it's very closely related to the gauge of that linear stability theorem. No, they're different. I'm sorry. Okay, I, I disagree. It's one of those things I don't understand. Well, we'll have to talk. We'll have to talk among uh, ourselves. But uh, uh, somehow, you know, these GCM conditions were fundamental in our work, and I, I don't quite understand why there is no reference to that. Well, I referenced to your work earlier. Not the GCM conditions. I never referred to. There's no, there's no uh, reference to it as, as far as I know. Anyway, I don't want. <laughs> I really want to congratulate you again. It was a very nice talk, but we should really solve this problem. Thank you. All right. There was a, a hand by Peter and then by Maxime. So Peter, why don't you? <laughs> yeah, uh, a, a nice talk. Um, could you explain a little bit why? R to the fifth curl beta is the, the right thing to measure the angular momentum? <laughs> so if one looks at the um, linearized Kerr solution, I, I, I don't know whether it's something you should call angular momentum, which is why I put it in quotation marks, but it serves the purpose for identifying the, the member of Kerr, which one converges, but the member of uh, ensuring the convergence of Schwarzschild rather than Kerr. May I make a comment about this, actually? Uh, that condition comes up first in our papers on the GCM papers. And in linear theory of the Fermat, Holzig, and Rodnianski, they have different conditions. Of course, it's linear, so it doesn't matter too much, but, uh, the, but that condition never shows up in uh, the curl beta condition. It's up the first time, I think, in our paper, in our, in our uh, second GCM paper. I was about to say that in the uh, linearized setting, the, this member of the linearized curve, uh, if you Measure this quantity that tells you exactly the angular momentum parameters for that linear curve. Yeah, but unfortunately, it was not in the linear paper of the Hermes Hotsenerodiansky, and you seem to say that everything was in that paper, and it was not. The other thing, that it was a beautiful paper. I have a, a, a whole admiration for that paper, don't get me wrong. But I think uh, the statement that somehow these conditions, uh, the gauge conditions and, and, and this angular momentum were in that paper, it's just uh, not exactly true. I mean, the linearized curve family in that paper? The, 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 the definition of the angular momentum was not done through curl of beta, I'm sorry. So the L equal one mod of curl of beta, it was not done that way. It was done using sigma, if I remember correctly. I mean, I don't know, I don't know whether you should call this uh, a, a uh, angular momentum. It serves to determine the convergence of Schwarzschild. I know, but it was first used in our paper, so I don't quite understand again why is this not quoted in your introduction. Anyway, I don't, I don't want to, I don't want to argue about this. I, I just, uh, I, I thought that since this was, this was mentioned, I should say something about it. Thanks, Maxime. So just, just a very quick question, Martin. First, thanks for a very, very beautiful talk. Um, so you said that you don't, don't say anything about the interior, but the, the black hole you have, they, they converge to Schwarzschild, right? Do you, have any, do you have any intuition about what happens in the interior of these black holes? So uh, the interior is actually a very, very interesting question. Um, in particular, so there's this work of that Fermos Luke about the interior of the solutions close to Kerr. So they have a, a condition on the uh, data in the event horizon in that problem that they converge to a member of the Kerr family, but with A not equal to 
zero. So it's slightly ironic that the things that that theorem applies to is exactly the, um, the complement of, of this theorem. Exactly. So uh, we write a conjecture in our paper that uh, uh, in the introduction that the interior of these solutions should all contain a tip which has compact intersection with the uh, Cauchy hypersurfaces, compact closure with the uh, Cauchy hypersurfaces. Uh, or, in other words, the, uh, that's a slightly weaker statement than saying there should be a space, space like. like. Well, it's, well, I don't know whether you could expect the entire singularity to be space like. But you could have also, like, you could have also a null piece, right, emanating, like, in right, principle, exactly. right? That's a very interesting question. Thanks, Martin. Any other questions?